The rules committee will come to order. Uh, Council Stan, would you do the blessing for us? Rise, please. Precious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for, for this day. Thank you for this beautiful fall weather. Lord, be, to, be with us as we go through the council meeting today. We pray for wisdom, pray for understanding. Let's say a word to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Stand approved. Uh, Mr. Buell with the Marshal Service. My representative for the Marshal Service, yes. Mr. Buell is going to be with FBI, David Cantor. Any questions for Mr. Tanner? Mr. Tanner, thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Officer of the Attorney General. I saw Mr. Henry around here somewhere. Good afternoon, Council. Always a pleasure to be in front of this esteemed body. Um, the, uh, let me uh, give you the highlights of what uh, our office has been working on. Uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, as to the, uh, the, uh, the Friedman case, uh, the cases, we are uh, set for oral argument on October 18th. Uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, there are three oral arguments. They begin at 9.30. We are the third case. Uh, they had projected that we should be going by two, but that's not a, that's not a promise. It's whenever the other ones are done, you're up. Uh, if you get a better sense of time, uh, I will let this, uh, this body know. Uh, obviously, uh, you all are very welcome to, uh, uh, to attend that, uh, to that hearing. Um, as to the uh, Northern District uh, 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 case involving the, the, the Freedman. The answer date is tomorrow for the federal defendants. Uh, and uh, so we expect uh, uh, a document to be filed. We have a standing order in my office that any file stamped document that pertains to this or any other case uh, involving the, uh, the Freedman or the, the UKB uh, gets automatically forwarded to uh, Gail or Shelly and will be distributed to you. So as soon as I receive something, you will shortly receive something there, thereafter. Uh, as to the UKB suits, the uh, uh, 76 acres uh, uh, case uh, uh, is progressing uh, uh, right along. Uh, we uh, have uh, filed our response. Uh, the, uh, we are awaiting the, uh, the Bureau's Answer to that to that case, uh, as to the to, to the, the two acres, which is the casino UKD. Uh, uh, you are aware of the uh, the complaint that we have filed. Uh, they uh, we we expect uh, <coughs> filing. I believe I want to say we better hold on. October twenty fifth. Uh, there will be a scheduling conference thereafter. And again, any document that is filed in this case, you all will know. We feel very, uh, we were very pleased with the complaint that, uh, uh, that we filed. Uh, it was a cooperative effort uh, that, uh, and I believe we uh, uh, asserted our position, which is very strong legally uh, in that uh, complaint, and uh, look forward to uh, getting that matter resolved and feel confident that we will be uh, victorious. Uh, Everything you know, we, there are a number of issues that are on uh, today's agenda and during the uh, uh, finance uh, that obviously we will cover when, uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, to be in. And I know you guys are kind of on a time rush when you get up to uh, the uh, employee appreciation, so I will yield any remaining time to questions. Questions for the Attorney General? Mm -hmm. Council 
public comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize, I was looking for my notes. I think I've left them in the car, but one of the things, uh, when I had a chance to review the full brief filing on the UKB that I had questions about was in our treatment of how we acknowledge the government of the UKB, that's not different than what we've done in the past, or is it somewhat different in acknowledging the historical identity of their government and, and what parts we acknowledge or don't acknowledge. We didn't treat uh, the, uh, uh, the acknowledgement of the uh, United Ketua Band in any different manner than we have uh, in the past historically. Uh, if uh, there's anything in more particular, you know, please just email me or come by the office. Okay. Uh, and, and I may okay, then, on another deal. Yeah, and that's that more than welcome to, to extend that invitation to uh, to everyone. Obviously, <coughs> you know, in a public meeting, I must be uh, general and broad in, in uh, any type of uh, litigation strategy. But I would welcome the opportunity to speak with each of you uh, individually. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other questions for Attorney General? All right. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Um, well, any updates on codification, Mr. Henry? Yes. We have submitted all material to uh, West Publishing. The, uh, we are awaiting a contract uh, for, them, uh, for them to return to us. Uh, apparently, you know, they've just gone through their fiscal year budgetary issues also. And so they said after October 1, we'd be able to give us a solidified contract. So we expect uh, uh, something next week, and, and we will inform the council of that. Thank you. Uh, representative from the Election Commission, Mr. Horton, back there. Chairman, Mr. Horton uh, is not here yet. Uh, you have the report. Any questions? Uh, I'm here to answer it and want the Secretary is here also. Does anyone have any questions for the uh, Election Commission? Mr. Chair, the only question that I have is uh, whether, uh, you don't have to answer it on the spot, whether you could get us a position on whether identification is required at the polling place. Just want the Commission's opinion and interpretation of the statute, just maybe sometime in the next month or so. Uh, so we just, I just want to see where the Commission stands on that issue. Uh, I think that's something that the uh, Election Commission is going to be looking at in their next, uh, their next meeting. They have just, well, we all know they we have just at uh, the last meeting decided on the election provider. And we're now working on getting that contract worked out, the, the written details of it. So uh, uh, they will be, uh, hopefully that will be accomplished in the next few days or weeks. And the uh, commission then will be able to start putting together the information for the election provider and also making the decisions such as the ID. Very good. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate that. Any further questions for the election commission? All right. Thank you, sir. Um, I'll just be out of order here for a moment. The, the uh, employee appreciation event, I'm told, is moved to the Quality Gym. I know an email went out on that, but it was asked to make that announcement. Also, the um, nurses are going to be here till 2 o'clock uh, to do flu shots. So they're going to be here just a bit longer. Um, <coughs> the tax commission, Ms. Webster. Good afternoon. I believe you have my report, and I'm going to entertain any questions if you have any. Any questions for Ms. Webster? <coughs> um, has the commission had a chance to look at the uh, subsidy legislation and? what steps you all will have to take to yes, we're working with realty it. and we're trying to we're we've gotten a letter ready to mail out to those people for that subsidy so we can get the w-9s back in and get that started and we've had one meeting with realty and we'll have another one to set up to make sure we all are on the same page for the process to make sure we can are able to get it done correctly yeah, mr thornton has a question sure. <clears throat> i know that we didn't close the owner operator that, uh, right. But uh, I think we'll have it on the agenda. We're going to put it on the agenda for next month to include those. Okay. And uh, if there's some proper type of wording we need, uh, I 
be sure that we would listen to you. I will see what I can find out. If there's anything specific, I'll get back to you. And I know of one. Is there any more than the one? Um, actually, I think there's four. Four? Well, great. I think there are four. If I'm not mistaken. Thank you. Ms. Thornton, any other questions for Ms. Webster? Okay, Ms. Webster, thank you. Thank you. All right, self-governance, uh, Ms. Hanley. I had uh, yesterday uh, sent you some information that had been requested uh, uh, last month in regards to the Delaware and, and some agreements that were with the Delaware. So I provided that as an update from last month with the history. So any questions? Any questions? Uh, yes, Mr. Lane. Could you provide that to us? I wonder in print for hard copy. Yes, yes, I can. Uh, I did provide it an email to uh, okay. Shelley. So, but I can, I can give you hard copy. Shelley has it. Yes. Okay. Well, I'll give it to her. Questions, Mr. Lady? I've got a couple about amendments to the MOA from the Delaware Agreement. And I wonder, as I understand it, there have been two now. And this is more in line with the discussion than a question, maybe. I wonder if council should not have been brought into that discussion. And No, the council should not have voted on that. Attorney General. Yeah. yeah. Yes, the, uh, the, the amendment that, uh, the, the second one that, that I, my office has, has been involved in, uh, <coughs> actually uh, was uh, the, the, the memorandum of, of, uh, of agreement allows for. Uh, uh, you know, agreements to be reached between the two governments. This was an instance where there was a uh, uh, environmental uh, monies that uh, was awarded, you know, uh, through uh, to, to the Delawares through us, thirteen thousand um, dollars. Had we not reached some type of agreement, they were going to lose that. Uh, it's a, a simple uh, agreement that that, that, they, that we had reached with them. Uh, it does not convey any type of uh, jurisdictional uh, issues. Um, uh, the, the document actually uh, probably should be titled an agreement instead of an amendment. Uh, but, but at any rate, um, uh, I will keep the council informed of any issues, including negotiations uh, with the Cherokee Nations and, and, and the, uh, the Delaware tribe. Any further questions, uh, Councilor Lang? Yeah, yeah is that, was that agreement initially voted on by council? Yes. 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 yes, it was. By both councils. By both councils. So, any amendment should not be followed up with uh, going through council. Is my question. Well, the, the 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 memorandum of agreement allows for agreements to be made between the uh, the, the two governments. Okay. Yeah. And um, this is what that was. Uh, it wasn't. It didn't change the uh, any responsibilities. Uh, of the, the, the governments, it didn't change any uh, intent of or, 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 or anything between uh, the, the, the language of the the, uh, the memorandum the memorandum of, uh, of agreement did not change. It was to allow this pass through agreement. That again, if we didn't do that in a quick in, in a quick fashion, the Delaware's were going to lose out. Uh, a thir you know, was going to lose thirteen thousand dollars. It's not a lot of money, but to you know to the Delaware's that is, and uh, we. Uh, we're attempting to be good neighbors with, with, with the Delaware. Uh, anything that is of substance, obviously, uh, we would uh, uh, bring the council in on in a heartbeat. And, and I am a good neighbor to the Delaware. I, I school with them, raised with them, surrounded with them. Some of my family are intermarried with them. Uh, however, if, if we, if council wants passed on this in a way, it, Kind of surprises me that when a change is made to a document that's as important as this one appears to be, 
it's not brought back before the council. Well, we we yeah we give the uh, the council and and everyone knows my reputation as to the council um, uh, all all respect. Uh, but uh, in, you know again, this agreement that we that we did <coughs> was not violative of the, the memorandum and was allowed under the memorandum. I, I, I'm still, I still have questions okay. on it, but I'll, I'll go ahead and leave that for later. Thank you. And feel free to come to the office anytime and, and we'll discuss it <coughs> more fully. And I will say that um, we have other grants and funding agreements <coughs> that are already authorized within the uh, existing MOA. Uh, and they apply for grants and different funding within that authorization. And again, I'm not an attorney, but but that to me is already authorized within the existing MOA. Um, and considering the timeline of this, we were trying to, uh, as Todd said, try to keep them from losing that money once we were notified and some issues arose around that. Um, and if you'll recall at the last council meeting, we were dispensing of reports, but I did ask if I could address the council to inform you of this and that it had taken place, because to me that's something that the council should be aware of that we were, we were working on. That's what Cal wants. If, um, this, I think last month I referred to this and I, I have it with me. So the Delaware Indian News from July 2012, and I, this is the way I hear uh, Councilman Lay's concerns, and they're my concerns too. I, I'm appreciative that we responded first, before I read from this, responded in order to make sure that the programs were able to continue and those things. Um, and I know that if the last time I recall reading the MOA was there was uh, the ability to respond in that manner and that it didn't take coming back for both councils to approve. But what I'm hearing from the Delaware Indian News dated July 2012 is much different from that. So in one paragraph from a message from Chief Paula Pachonik, it says, as promised, we are working with the Cherokee Nation on the, our memorandum of agreement. Curtis and Councilman Young are the mediators of this project. Then you go from the desk of Nate Young, who's a council member. Curtis and I are also in the process of renegotiating the memorandum of agreement with the Cherokee Nation. The past sessions with the Cherokees have been very fruitful, and who the Cherokees are, I don't know. The end result will be restoration of our federal programs prior to the loss of federal recognition. That's a lot different than the MOA we have in place today. This negotiation is making steady progress. We're just now hearing about it. Our tribal government has been functioning exceptionally well. Our chief has done an excellent job of being a full-time chief, wanting to take tribe to the next level. Um, and then it's tremendous progress, and they're going through. So apparently there's been a lot of stuff going on, and we don't know anything about it. So that's, that's discerning. And I know this is only one perspective, but this is online on the Delaware Tribal website and available for anyone to print off. I so. think they've been over uh, uh, generous with what uh, uh, they would report, you know, uh, uh, I would disagree with uh, Mr. Young's assessment of uh, uh, any negotiations. Uh, we have talked to uh, the Delaware, and we have asked them, you know, uh, uh, what uh, they would, uh, uh, you know, a, a list of objectives. We've received that list. Uh, we don't, uh, uh, you know, uh, some of those some of those uh, items are as me have been mentioned, are completely unattainable uh, to the Delaware. Uh, but uh, we are, you know, we will listen to, to, to anyone. No substantive agreements or, or negotiations have taken place. Uh, the, the, the meetings have, uh, uh, I don't know, there's even, I think there's been two. Uh, but in uh, very, uh, um, oh, I won't say premature, but very, very, uh, We, nothing close to an agreement uh, has been has been reached, and obviously, if, if negotiations were to get uh, substantive, uh, the council would be, and obviously, the council would have to approve any uh, uh, any memorandum of agreement. 
So just so my mind is clear, you've helped answer some questions that I had after reading this that was brought to my attention. Um, who is we, and, and what is the proper path for amending the MOA? Just so all kinds are clear, we don't have any... The, the, the person who, uh, who would be in charge of... Uh, uh, Negotiating anything with outside government would be Secretary of State Charles Head. Obviously, Ms. Handy, uh, being the director of, uh, of self governance, uh, would, would be involved in every step of the way. Uh, my office has been to a certain extent, uh, but obviously, my office, you know, if, if, if things progress, will be involved at a much higher level. Uh, uh, and, then the, uh, and then anything that is uh, uh, proposed uh, would have to be approved by the principal chief and approved by this council. And if a Delaware asked on their side, as far as we know, it would also have to be approved in the same manner by their chief and council. Yes. Okay. Yes. And keep in mind that the discussions that, that we've had, um, at least like right now, I'm pretty much looking at compliance of the existing MOA. You know, do, are we doing what we have committed to do? Are we sharing the uh, wishes of both parties? Um, so are we abiding by the existing MOA? And we've been working with internal programs to ensure that what the nation obligated us to do, that we are actually carrying that out. So there's that piece that primarily I've been involved in. Um, so if they want to change something that's going forward, what that agreement would look like, there, to my knowledge, there have not been any actual negotiations that have taken place. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Councilman Lay, you had a follow-up question. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, it seems to me, and I'm not a lawyer, and my memory may not be as good as yours, wasn't this MOA tied to the BIA letter, which lacked federal recognition to Delaware? And if you go changing that, do we start a whole hubbub all over again? Oh well, <laughs> I thought you were going to say something. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, yeah. With the uh, um, your your memory we serves through, you well. We went through about a ten year period. Yeah. 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 So we don't want to do that. No, I mean, uh, you know, if if that could, because you know, there's three three actually three groups that would have to be copacetic with this. You know, the the Cherokee Nation government, the Delaware government, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs to make sure that you know that that they're. Uh, the federal government. Okay, Pardon you. me. I, st I stand corrected. <laughs> a component of the United States federal government, which would be the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, so, yeah, you, you, you know, the, the, these things don't happen, you know, on a cocktail nap napkin. You know. I, I just let me just make a kind of a comment. I'd like to be the whole council being included on any more talks or negotiations. I'm not sure what we're calling about that. But Take who, who signed the amendment? Was it principal chiefs, the last two amendments, or was it the secretary of state? Or? I, I really don't know. Who should sign? I mean, who's second? I guess is the question. The first one was Jerry Douglas and Melanie Knight. And this one was Bill John Baker and Paula the Delaware. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Bird. Good. Okay. I, I just had one question. So the thirteen thousand that was saved, it it was saved because we amended the agreement. Is that is that? Yes. Correct? And keep in mind that, uh, and I apologize for not getting back to you sooner. Uh, we've had some year-end deadlines that I'm trying to meet, including getting our BIA contract dispute act in. But uh, we do have. In the discussions with the uh, Department of Interior for our <coughs> current uh, multi-year funding agreement tied to our compact, um, the Delaware had been, uh, uh, their funding had come through our compact since 2006. The Department of Interior has raised some legal concerns about that process. Um, that's what raised the issue with them. Now that they actually have a solicitor's opinion 
stating that there are some legal issues with that. Um, that's why we try to address it in that manner. Okay, my question is more fundamental. There was a okay. change to the agreement. It sounds to me like what I'm hearing is that when there's some change of some degree of substance, you'll come to the council and we'll have to ratify that change. Some other changes you won't. Who makes the decision as to whether a change is warrant is coming before the council? That's my question. This change didn't. What changes, what, what has to happen? Who decides whether it comes to the council? Well, I think it, it, it's, you know, uh, the decision would be, you know, the executive branches, you know, to, to, if, if whether it was a, um, a substantive agreement or not. And, and that's either a, a, a that, that's, that's an objective uh, and, and that's, uh, finding. That's an objective finding? Well, yeah, I, I think so. Okay. You know. Okay. So, and that, that might be part of the issue here is that a change gets made. There's a judgment call of whether it's of significant substance to warrant council ratification. That decision gets made before the council knows that there is a decision to make. And that's why I think there's a lot of questions about does it come before the council? Who's at the negotiating table? I mean, my personal opinion is the Secretary of State, the chief through the Secretary of State, negotiates with other governments. Now, the council, in my opinion, ought to be kept advised of some developments, but when it comes to changing the agreement, I guess it is a big question, does the council ratify it? Um, and, and when is the decision made as to whether the council ratifies it? And if we're not in the loop, then after the fact, we're we're setting in judgment saying you should have come before the council. Or, you know, that's why this issue gets raised, I think. And let so. me clarify here again. Uh, I apologize, but you don't have the actual document in front of you, apparently. Sure. But, and again, I'm not an attorney, but within the four corners of the existing agreement, um, within the uh, I'm trying to find here in the section. Paragraphs 3 and 4, section I. The nation and the tribe enter into a written agreement regarding the operation by the tribe of the programs and services. The nation, through the Secretary of State of the nation, makes a written determination that the nation is ineligible or elects not to apply for the programs or services, or by the date of 30 days after the date of receipt by the nation of written notice specifying a particular program or service be a certified mail by the tribe to the Secretary of State of the Nation. The Nation has not objected in writing to the tribe administering the program or service. So in other words, it, to me it's within there a written notice uh, in agreement with the Delaware that we would transfer that particular So, so the, the, the original agreement contemplated there would be yes. this type of change and it's That's the administration's the position that because of that provision they had the latitude to unilaterally make this change without coming for a particular program and services, not changing the substance. So that's my yeah. Okay. But again, if we hear about it after the fact, we have to have this debate of a, an agreement that's already been made, and then it becomes academic, and then it becomes kind of frustrating. Councilman Burke, Vicky, out of courtesy, you know, on in the past, at least inform if not if you're not going to uh, uh, inform the full council inform at least the, the council members from that district. Then they'll communicate back to us as a courtesy. We have to do that. Okay. Councilman Lane, do you have another question? I was just wondering if we, before we leave here today, we might have a hard copy of that taken away. Ms. Handy, can we get a copy sent over and then we can get it? It's already, it's already it was sent over yesterday. Okay, so we'll, we'll get that produced. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Handy. Gaming Commission, Mr. Hummingbird. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Everybody's enjoying this nice fall weather I ordered. Appreciate it. Okay. If you need anything else, just let me know. Nice uh, morning. Should be here in about an hour. <laughs> uh, just wanted to uh, bring a couple of things to uh, the council's attention. Um, if you haven't already heard, the ribbon cutting for the reopened Casino 3 is scheduled for tomorrow at 10 a.m. Hope to see everybody there and take a look at that fabulous place. It's, uh, it, it's just amazing what, what uh, a couple of million dollars can do for you. Uh, but it is a welcome addition. It, it, it completes the Hard Rock campus again, and we're glad to see it open. 
Uh, we had a couple of uh, developments late last week and earlier this week with the NIGC publishing some final rules on uh, some changes to the internal controls as well as uh, facility licensing requirements. We're currently examining all of those final rules and working to incorporate those into our rules and regulations, which we hope to take to our commission on the uh, uh, October 17th meeting. Um, we have changes in uh, the technical standards for Class II gaming machines uh, included in that, which includes a provision that is good for Oklahoma. Uh, the, uh, there was a grandfather clause that was included in the original controls that were published back in 2008 that would have meant a, a significant financial hardship for not only tribes in Oklahoma, but tribes anywhere that play Class II games. So rather than uh, bear the brunt of a 60 to $100 million cost uh, in coming into compliance with some technical aspects, uh, the NIGC has pushed that date out an additional five years, so tribes now have until 2013 to get all of the componentry replaced in the current Class II games. Uh, it provides us a little bit uh, of lead time to get that done, and probably by that time, a lot of the technology that we see in operation today will probably be phased out just through attrition. So it's a good thing. Uh, we're glad to see that they made those changes in the uh, mix and in the technical standards, and we're going to work to incorporate them because they come, become effective on October 22nd, so just, over, uh, just under a month uh, to get all of this work done, but we're, we're working hard to get it done. With that, I'll take any questions you might have. Questions for the January Council Party? I just want to say congratulations on this award you're winning. Uh, thank you. I think you started out, we got three bingo halls, and now we got the band, and uh, it's been quite an endeavor. I understand you're going to win, take this award on October the 2nd in Vegas. Yeah. Uh, go out there uh, on Monday. The award ceremony is uh, Tuesday night, and uh, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, be able to fit my head through the door whenever I get finished receiving the award. But uh, I'm looking forward to it. Well, congratulations! You've done Thank a good you. job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Garvin. Councilman Keener. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Jim, I was going to ask you what percentage are we within that five-year window of uh, treating the phase out or getting rid of the old stuff? Grandfather right, right now, 40% of our floor is Class II machines, and of that 40%, I'm going to um, go out on a limb right now and say roughly 20% is currently in compliance with the technical standards. Um, so with our, uh, if I can just pull that back up here, uh, with our uh, current makeup, uh, we have uh, right around 2,200 machines, I think that is. So right around 500, I would say, at this point, are currently compliant. Uh, and we're, I want to just kind of reemphasize one of the things that we're looking at here is uh, uh, system components. It's stuff like uh, bill receptors, printers, um, some things on the server. It doesn't have anything to do with game play. So as those parts wear out and die, essentially, they'll be replaced with equipment that is compliant with the technical standards as they're written now. So uh, we, we expect, uh, actually expect a great number of those to be changed out over the next couple of years because we have uh, a, a new software, uh, not super software, but a new uh, platform coming out actually next week that we're going to go out and see while we're in Las Vegas. So over the next couple of years, we expect a lot of these to be changed out for compliance uh, composure. Uh, but over the five years, it will be a much easier process to manage. You'll come with that five-year window the Yes. Here. Yes. Okay. I, I think uh, you know, you know, yeah. the emergency was urged just to eliminate the grandfather clause altogether. Um, but at the very least, it needed to be extended out. And they, they finally listened to that uh, uh, the second option because they, they still want the class two game components to be compliant with a standard so they felt that a date was necessary but uh, just not as soon as they had originally played. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman Burke. <coughs> Jane, you say about 40% were class two? Right. Uh, based on our uh, monthly uh, totals that we get, I think right now we're sitting at 56% uh, 
a little over almost 57 percent are class three and 42 percent are class two okay. and that that rate has been holding steady for about the past five years it's been about 60 40 mm -hmm. going up and down as uh, uh, as the seasons go uh, but it, it's been holding that that uh, 60 40 split for about five years now that, that's a good ratio mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further questions for Mr. Uh, Schoenberg? Okay, very good, Jamie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, next we have a report from the uh, Youth Council. Yeah. Hello. Hey there, everybody. How are you doing? Okay, uh, um, this is an activities report. This quarter brings us to the online election to seat new tribal uh, youth council. With the number of voters climbing every day, the outcomes of the coming elections were very exciting. Um, the election results have been posted September 24th on uh, Cherokee.org. Um, we had 21 candidates, um, nine from District 1, three from District 2, two from District 3, uh, three from District 4, and four from District 5. Um, so now we have our seated council from the elections, and so we will be doing the swearing-in ceremony on October 6th. All of you are welcome to attend. Uh, it's pretty exciting. Um, Daniel Culp and Eric Butter traveled to Phoenix, Arizona to represent the Tribal Youth Council uh, and Cherokee Nation at the uh, Unity Conference. Their efforts resulted in a major change to the Constitution of Unity, which will result in more uh, equitable regional presentation, or representation. And uh, one of the major things they were working on when they were there was uh, trying to figure out a way to reach out to our youth in the satellite communities, like in California and in other states. And so they're working on building kind of a standard to work off of, kind of form groups of youth in those different communities so that we can be more of a united Cherokee. Um, at Cherokee Holiday, members of the council assisted several uh, groups with uh, the parade and uh, at the powwow. Um, the group conducted 50-50 raffles that benefit the powwow committee and um, we helped serve dinner prepared by volunteers uh, and for the head staff at the powwow. And finally, one of the major things we're working on is kind of putting together a formal budget for administration to work with for the youth council. Something so that you know what we're gonna be doing, you know how much money we're like estimated to need and so that there won't be any confusion. So that it's just kind of clear cut and understood. And so, it's a little bit more <coughs> We appreciate you. Oh, good. Thank you. What time on October 6th? 8.30. Uh, starts at 10. 8.10. Uh, and then we'll have the presentation. 10. 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Okay. Yeah. I heard like 20 people respond. I was like, okay, 10 a.m. I get, is it in the council chambers? On Saturday, October 6th, 10 a.m. <laughs> yeah. Any questions? Thank you. Any other questions for the uh, council member? <laughs> Thank you for uh, helping us out at the uh, powwow. I mean, that, that was great. We needed some volunteers, and you guys stepped up. Appreciate it. We always appreciate it. Enjoy helping out with the powwow. Uh, I had one question I, I had asked earlier in the day for uh, District 4 reps, what school they went to. We got that list, and I appreciate it. I probably should ask just for the whole council, because other people might be curious. I wonder if we could get a list that would show what school they attend. We see what district they're in, but yeah. we're, we're curious about what school they're from. They've all been sent their, basically, introduction packets, and so that's when they act. Our election system doesn't pull that information in. So, so this next week, we should be getting their packets. And then once they get all that up, they send them packets. You do all have uh, the list. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. And, uh, Mr. Justice with the uh, Registrar of Citizenship Data Update. Just a few numbers to report this month. Uh, 38 cease notices and uh, 908 address changes. Just a little months. I'm sure you know that you owe me several items, so yes, I've I haven't got a, a return email or phone call in several weeks. I think Louise asked for that too, so. Yes, I've got to apologize for not getting back to council members on the request. I've been out for several weeks with a uh, new baby who was born, so I've been on. Thank you. Um, and then 
fortunately, I had a grandmother pass away. Uh, I'm sorry. And now I'm fighting off a cold, so. <laughs> it's just kind of been one thing after another. But I, I will do my best to try to get back to uh, council requests, emails, as soon as I can. When do you anticipate? Uh, today was my first day back in the office, okay. so I will make an attempt uh, in the next couple of days to try to get to this. Further questions for Mr. Justice? Okay. Thank you. All right. Now move on to old business. First item of old business is a resolution confirming the nomination of Donnie Mack as board member of the Cherokee Nation Community Association Corporation. Madam Speaker, did you take that? Yes, this was an item that was tabled last month while we got more information about some issues that were brought up during the discussion. Uh, this is a resolution confirming the nomination of Donita Mackey as a board member of the Cherokee Nation Community Association Corporation. And Donnie is here today so that you all can <coughs> ask some more questions. You certainly can. Yeah, and I would put that in the form of a motion. A motion, we have a second, we have a second by Councilman Do you have any questions for this man? Councilman Coates. Well, I, um, to get further information, I just wondered if anyone had made inquiries or if you had or I would uh, call from the IRS or. Uh, inquiry was made at the uh, Attorney General's office. I had assigned Ms. O'Dell mm -hmm. to, uh, to look into the matter and she can report. I did call a representative from the IRS, Lori Burnett, who is our Indian Tribal Government Specialist for tax exempt government entities. She said this is not an issue, that as long as they're not paid disproportionately in some way, which she would not be paid being on this board, that it's not an issue. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. no. Can I make a, a quick announcement? Ms. O'Dell was just recently named Employee of the Year uh, in my office. So. <laughs> Dale, notwithstanding your award, you got to come back. <laughs> <laughs> Councilman Cowboys has a question for you. Thank you. Um, I, I think the more the question, the way I understood it was it wasn't just a matter of pay, um, but it was also that that board oversees Miss um, Mackey's position, and it could affect her salary in that position, either continuing the position, not continuing the position, promotion raises. They don't, that corporation does not um, oversee her budget. They're not, they're a component of CAUTA, they're under it, but that also encompasses all of the 14 county organizations, and so it's just one part of it, and they would not be determining the person. Okay. They, they have no feedback no on her personnel okay. issues or anything. I just want to clarify, because that was one of the questions, and that, I didn't hear that answer. No, no, sorry. Okay, and congratulations on your award. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Certainly, uh, Councilman Coates had a good well, question. Same thing, and it, it goes back to something um, um, Councilor Thornton had asked last time, which was a question of uh, who who is it from Cherokee Nation that reports to this board? And I believe Ms. Matthew <coughs> was part of, well, nobody from Cherokee Nation really did, but Rick Gassaway has always reported to this board. And we understand that the programs for at large counselors are all going to go under um, Ms. Mackey's direction now. So it would be Ms. Mackey who would be reporting to the board and also sitting on the board. Is that, is that's what I understood to be. Okay. Okay. An issue for IRS first. Okay. okay. And I have one other, if I make sure, uh, for Ms. Mackey herself, which is that I said, <laughs> I said before, uh, I think last time, and I know that for several years the, the discussion on this board has, the intent has been to place additional at-large people from the communities into positions as board members. And, um, and we, I know that at the last board meeting, and I realize you weren't there, but uh, at the outcome that you weren't able to be there, but... Um, but Mr. Sutherland had said something that he had spoken with the administration and that the administration, and I believe this is the way he put it, wanted to keep control of this board. And given that there are only two people, at-large people, on a five, out of the five on a five-person board, uh, my question to you, I guess, is that as a board member, would you be in favor of expanding the number of seats on the board so that additional 
at large people could serve on it because as I understand it, this is always a good tenet of good community development and development generally is that it be directed by the very people that are <coughs> impacted by it, uh, which would be at large people. So w would you be in favor of uh, adding <coughs> at large people to this board as, an, as a board member? Well, I am the director of community leadership and I believe community leadership is out in the communities. Um, I just uh, take direction. And so I would be in favor of working in that direction, uh, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done initially on this board. Um, I did miss the last board meeting, but I did as a volunteer intend the three before that. And, and so some of the issues keep coming up over and over. Issues are not being solved, such as uh, insurance and uh, uh, places that are rented mm -hmm. for meetings and those sort of things. So I think there are some issues that initially just need to be addressed, and then you know we could look at something like that in the future. Okay, so I'm not really hearing a response there. I think um, to the to the notion that at large people should be part of the direction that they should be a component of the direction, not that it should come at them from, from us explicitly. So. I speak like a Cherokee, which means I speak around issues until I get back to the issue. <laughs> so, uh, but I thought I was very clear in a Cherokee sense. But um, oh, yes, me. I guess I'm not quite as Cherokee. <laughs> no, that's not what I'm saying. That's how I communicate. Uh, but. Um, I, are you looking for a yes or no answer? I'm looking for a commitment. <laughs> I, I am. I'm looking for a commitment um, for the additional involvement and the expansion so that at-large people will be part of the direction uh, of the board that directs the group, that directs their programming and so forth, so that it's not... It, it's not something that's being done to them and being done for them, but something that is being also done by them. So I am looking for that commitment. Yes, I am. Well, I would like to work to that means. I would. I have established some really great relationships in the at-large communities, um, and so I can't say a yes commitment, but I would like to work on those relationships and and look, you know, at that in the very near future, actually. And so. Um, that's how I will answer. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Any further questions from Ms. Mackey? Any further discussion, Councilman Burr? No, I. Uh, no, it's not a no. <laughs> what it's what yes. Yeah, it's, it's not, not a no. no. <laughs> uh, Councilman Burr has the floor. Council. No, I just want to commend you on working out in communities. You were at the same community meeting I was at you know, last week, and I appreciate you being there and uh, coming from a traditional family and your background. I just appreciate your support. Yes. Back to the last question. You said the answer is not a no, but it's not a yes either. Is that right? Um, you're asking for a commitment to work to have the at large on the board, and there has this board has been around about four or five years, and so there's been opportunity <coughs> for that to happen. And if I can work toward an end to make that happen, I would love to work. But there are a lot of things internally that need to be worked on as well. And that's going to be my primary focus <coughs> for the time being. But it's still not a yes or no. Okay. Thank you. It's definitely not a yes or no. <laughs> Noted, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Thornton. Uh, having that part quick on the board, where do you meet? Pardon me? Where do you meet? Uh, we meet at various places, but usually at, at the CADA conference room. That's here in Tuttle? Yes, yes, here. Over okay. by where the new uh, model homes are. We have that large people in there. Who's going to bear the expense <laughs> to bring those people to that meeting? Well, there is an at-large uh, budget uh, to bring people to, for instance, the annual summit that brings leadership from each of the 22 communities, and I believe they just had their second year. Um, and so there are, there are some budget items for them. To travel. Then does that those budget items cover that person per month come to the meeting? That hasn't happened yet. That's just for the summit. But so far, these folks have been traveling here on their own. Uh, there mm -hmm. are only, there are two at large uh, advisors. I realize that's happening, and, but when you go drawing a person in as a board member, I know that 
that eventually there's going to be somebody who won't get paid for. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you go paying for expenses for sure. travel and overnight stays and food, and then, uh, of course, there's people out there that wouldn't have to, but there's people out there that wouldn't have to mm -hmm. on a business board. And still yet they're on the board. But uh, I'm sure that if you start this, then you're, you're going to have to come for funding for these board members. And if you have two, three, four, five, it's, it's very possible to get expensive. And I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know where we're at on that. They meet four times a year, okay. and I know I have visited with Ryan Sierra a little bit. He's working with the at-large under CADA, and we've talked about online meetings and how that if, if that's something that would even be possible and, and still be in compliant with, compliance with the Oklahoma uh, Open Meetings Act and those sort of things. And so we're, we're researching you know, to try to find a way that we can stay um, connected even with our, you know, technology we have available to us today, so. Well, uh, when you say that they cover their own expenses, yes. there are people out there that couldn't cover their own expenses sure. that uh, would be good to sit on that board. Yes. So, I mean, you know, it, it didn't just uh, <clears throat> solve easy deal or easy solve deal. No, I mean, there it. are a lot of things to consider mm -hmm. uh, and how to make this happen. That's why, I mean, do I believe people in the community should have a say so in how they're governed? Absolutely. <laughs> but um, we need to work on, my focus is going to be initially just uh, kind of getting the board kind of in order and, and working to make sure that we're in compliant and uh, we're compliant with the, the rules and, and doing what we're supposed to do, which is connecting to communities and cultural outreach. I know that that budget has came a long way. You know, that's, what is that budget now? I don't know. There was a recent increase in the at-large budget, mm -hmm. and it will be coming out as its own program, and I advocated for that. And, mm -hmm. and none of, I'm not getting a boosted salary from that either. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's something that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's something I felt like we needed to do for the at-large community. Okay, thank you. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Coates. Well, I just, you know, I just Maggie's answered them pretty well already, but I had some responses for Councilman Thornton's questions, and I think that um, that there, you know, the technology is there, and this has been discussed in meetings, you know, to, to bring people in um, electronically through meetings, but also we were looking at initially at first at people who are nearby, Oklahoma City, Dallas, Kansas City, places, Wichita, that they can get here. And as Ms. Mackey stated, the, the two people who are already on the board who are at large do come here at their own expense. So, and, and that is part of the agreement, and that would have to be part of the agreement, I would think, for a while. But, but I, I, you know, I just, I'm, I feel very strongly that the programs for at large people, for any community, should be not only, you know, governed for them, but should be governed by them. And. Um, and nobody knows that large people better than that large people themselves. And I just think that that input is, is extremely valuable. And so that's why I'm really kind of hoping and, and pushing hard here, I, I acknowledge, uh, for, for a <coughs> so, Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Kessler. Thornton, you have a question. No, more or less a statement. I, I, you know, people from Kansas and from Texas and New Mexico, or Arkansas, they're probably pretty easy to... We've got people in California and, and a, a large group out there that, that they, I think they need to be represented just like people from Texas or Kansas or anywhere else. So I wouldn't let those people, cut those people out. No, no. You know. no, not at all. And I have, like I said, I've established some relationships there. Just on a personal level, we were very excited <coughs> that at our ceremonial ground that uh, Councilwoman Coates asked about last month in Kenwood, we had a ceremonial ground from Cherokee, North Carolina come. About 30 people on their own raised their own funds to come here, as well as representatives uh, and friends from Southern California and Northern California came here on their own, used their own means to come here just to participate in that event. And so, um, 
but uh, you know we certainly want and I I listen to them and um, no matter what community I, I'm in if, whether it's local or at large well when you talk about the stomp grounds you're talking about a way of life for your people who've been that way for ever it seems yes. like and uh, I'm sure that at uh, Stokes on, on their last all day meeting had people from all over the world just about there, as far as I know. I was there and I met several. But, you know, and they all came on their own, you know, just like you said. So I'm with you there, but whatever. <laughs> well, I want to find the means to bring, of course, more people to the table and talk about what they want. And as a matter of fact, I've really been doing that kind of work not even just on the board, it's just, just staying in touch with people. And Ryan Sierra started that that process too as part of his work and, and gaining feedback from the community. So we're not hearing just from a particular, a particular leader from each of the 22 groups. We're hearing from a lot of people from those groups uh, at large, plus a survey we've been working on locally. So we're hearing from a wide variety of uh, people, no matter where they are. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Milwaukee State. Yeah, we've uh, maybe we've kind of extended our time here. I'd like to call for questions if you don't mind. The question's been called. All those in favor of the nomination say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. All right, congratulations. Thank you. Our next item of business is item number two of old business. It's <coughs> an act uh, exempting um, certain veterans from. Uh, the tax uh, councilman, uh, Madam Speaker. Yes, um, I have been informed that they're still working on uh, a definition of veterans for this act with uh, Sharon's group. And so I would ask that you table one more month, and I have been promised. It will be ready. Second. That it will be ready. Okay. Well, Madam Speaker. Second by Councilor Karen Watts. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those same sign. All right. These tables for another month. Uh, item number three of old business is up next. Uh, act related to drug testing for elected officials. Uh, Councilman Burke. <coughs> yes, Mr. Chairman. We have uh, one component in there that was not amended at this time, so I'll just remove that. Uh, we table it for one more month. Second. And by that time, we should have it. Rest in the appropriate way. Second by uh, Councilman Bird, second by Councilman Walking Stick. All those in favor say aye. 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 The same sign. M Mr. Chairman, I know that it's already been tabled, but just asking that the author to address the mechanisms for how those things are done and who can, you know. Lots and lots of questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> lots of okay. Questions. Thank you. Very good. Uh, we now move to old, uh, old business item number four. This is a resolution to determine the location of, uh, of a certain uh, residence in Cherokee Nation. Council Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you remember, last month we uh, had two different maps and we were kind of confused and terrible. I think we made matters resolved, but let me read the resolution. It's now the resolution to determine the location of. 2550 South York Street in the study as a residence located within the jurisdiction of the Cherokee Nation. And I make a motion this be approved. Second. The motion is second by Councilman uh, Thornton. Well, I'd like to defer to David Justice. Okay. <coughs> Mr. Justice, before you start, Councilman Watkins, did you want to make some yeah. remarks? Uh, how many maps do we have now? <laughs> How many maps do we have now? It's in the book. Uh, many, many. All right. It, it, you're referring, Councilman Garvin, you're referring to the map we've got in our book right Okay, very good. Mr. Justice? <clears throat> yes, I know this uh, address has caused a lot of confusion and a lot of problems. Uh, I'll try to, be, try to be quick about this. Um, there are several mapping programs out there. Bing Maps, Yahoo Maps, Google Maps. The company that we use is probably the, the world leader in creating this online data. Uh, unfortunately though, every one of them has their little flaws and their little problems. And this just happens to be one of those locations where the program that we use, that we gave to the Election Commission, 
didn't drop the point exactly on the house. Okay, Google Maps does. Google Maps is a little more accurate in this particular location in this instance. It's kind of like uh, the difference between a Chevy and a Ford. They basically do the same thing, uh, but they do it in a little bit different manner. Um, these tools that we use to geocode these addresses to find them, they're, they're just that, they're tools. They get us close. Um, unfortunately, in this location, uh, it's not quite as accurate as it is for the rest of the location and the program that we primarily use. And that's where this problem has arised. Um, the program that we use is probably the most accurate for everything in the 14 county area, but unfortunately, this is just one of those little problem areas. Um, we've run across this address several times before. Um, given that the house itself is actually split by the jurisdictional boundary, we rely on the program to make the call themselves as to whether it's in or out because every program has different rules, different policies in regards to if an address is, at, is in the jurisdictional area or is going to be out. So that's a little synopsis there. If you have any questions about a particular problem or <coughs> if you have any questions, please just let me know. Thank you, Mr. Justice. Mr. Garvin, do you have any further comments to make about your legislation? I think it's very clear that uh, the two different maps or three or four that they use, uh, they're all good in their place, but this house is just uh, very unique, and it's just one in a thousand. And the whole Cherokee Nation, where that line goes through there, cuts off one closet and the rest of the house is inside the district. So I think everybody agrees that it should be considered inside. So this will give guidance to the election commission. We're not trying to tell them how to do their business, but they just need to look at both maps and make a decision. This needs to be passed today, right? Mr. Garvin, I just maybe comment. I agree with you. I, I think these maps are always estimates. I mean, the boundaries are always estimates. Some are really, really good estimates, and some are maybe not so good estimates, depending on the technology. But at the end of the day, I think it's within our realm to make this call, and this map depicts a house that sits <coughs> in Cherokee Nation. If I guess if you're in the living room in the driveway, and if you're in the back part, you're not. But um, it seems to me it's, it's appropriate for us to make the call. Um, so any further discussion on the legislation, Councilman Lake? Mr. Gerber, it looks like nope, you know, probably 98% of this house is in. I'd like to see a surveyor go out there and tell me the same thing that this little red line tells me. And so until then, I'm going to have to just abstain. I'm not going to vote no, but because it looks like the house is in. And, but I'm going to have to abstain for two reasons. I'd like to see a surveyor physically tell me it's in. And I'm not sure that the election commission shouldn't be doing this. Those two things. But I understand where you're coming from with that. Yeah. I understand. But I'm going to have to abstain for that. Councilor oh, Fishy, huh? So is it the left or the right side of the team? Right. West side. <laughs> you're right. I know left and right. <laughs> Any further questions to Councilor Fishy, huh? Okay. Madam Speaker? Well, I, I just wondered, I saw the, uh, or see the uh, election commission back in the back. I just wondered what their position was on that. I, I don't know if it doesn't need to be a, a rule rather than a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, is there some policy or some rule that can be written where these things are taken care of? Because I doubt that this is the only house. That has this problem. Yeah, if I could, it seems to me we could develop a rule, or the commission could develop a rule which would say that if uh, any portion of the residents resides in Cherokee Nation, that's in Cherokee Nation. We could do anything we want, I think. But I am curious about the election commission's position on this. And Councilman Cowans, I see your hand is raised, but could we get the commissioner's uh, or commission's position on this before we proceed? Yes, I think as uh, Mr. Justice said, uh, the, the one of the maps that the commissioner has showed it outside the district. There's been new map since then that showed in. And uh, I think he explained how that came about. But I think it's the election commission's position that, that 
it is the council's prerogative that their <coughs> district the Cherokee Nation and to set the boundary lines for the districts. However, I think the commission feels that under the Constitution, the Constitution gives the council that power to set the district lines. However, I think the Constitution gives the commission the power and responsibility to determine who is within those lines. I think if the council starts picking individual <coughs> citizens and telling the commission, you're going to vote in this district or that district, I'm afraid that the council might be invading the province of the election commission in that regard. Now, the election commission has had these new maps, and they're not against re-looking at the situation uh, as far as if, if they, and I, I like the idea that the councilor had about getting a surveyor out there, if they had if they had absolute proof as to where this house is situated, and I, the council or the commission is certainly not as vast and adverse to re-looking and uh, based on new information making a new decision on it. But our concern is, our concern is that uh, uh, the constitutional provisions delineate the responsibilities of the council and of the uh, election commission, and uh, uh, we're a little concerned that the council might be invading the province of the election. Hey, advance figures to the floor since you invite the commissioner. Uh, has the person that lives in this house? come to the commission. No, and that's, that's another thing I wanted to mention. I think the way our Constitution is set up and our court system, the person that's affected by that, if, if he is put in a district and he doesn't believe he should be in that district or he's at large and he thinks he should be in a district, I think his remedy is one to come to the commission, uh, voice his complaints to them, they can relook at it. If he doesn't get any satisfaction, and he can certainly go to district court and have the court decide whether he's in this district or that district. So, but this this person has not, and the commission has told me this. This person has not come before the commission at any time or sent any written documents or anything requesting that he be changed from at large to this district. Has this issue been considered by the commission on a, as an agenda item on one of your committee meetings? No, it has not, not, not since it was originally done. I, and I'm assuming it probably hasn't been because he didn't make a written or personal right. request? That's right. Sorry. Now, he's not made any kind of request that be on the agenda that be reconsidered. Martha may have more information. It was in our minutes in April, and it is in our minutes now, and it was on the agenda. This is the application of the gentleman. This is the map we use. This is the date, and it's from Mr. Justice's office. We made our decision based on this information. The election commission has never heard from this individual. We've only heard from Mr. Gardner that we are not correct. I'm just making sure it's your belief as their attorney that this falls within their bailiwick and not ours. Yes, that's that my we've opinion. established the boundary lines. Now they establish who is inside that line or outside that line. That's my opinion on the Constitution. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Council Watts, you have a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think this points directly to why the Administrative Procedures Act is so important so that there are guidelines for processes and procedures for challenging things so that it doesn't come to this body. Um, so what I'm hearing is you guys are, the Election Commission will be putting written procedures out for all these things to protect the voter rights. I mean, I'm still going to support this today because I think it's in our purview. Um, on the individual to determine not, I mean, it's up to you guys where those, when that district ends up falling out, but a lot of, that's not even true. So, but I think it's still in our purview to determine 
these maps today, but I think that these individuals should have the right to go to your body and have written procedures available and know what that is so that they don't have to come to their council member and ask for things like this, regardless of whether you would have been under the Administrative Procedures Act or not. So. I think I agree with you there. I think the uh, commission is, is intending to do that. Okay. And I, I think yeah. they've always had that availability. All the since they didn't like a decision of the commission, all they had to do was come back and ask it be put on the agenda and consider it. And, we've been, and since I've been there, we've considered two or three of them. But it shouldn't be a case by case basis where it could change depending on personalities or other things that affect it. It needs to be written down so that everybody's evaluated fairly by the same standards, is all I would ask. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And, and Mr. Chapin, um, I understand your position on the Sister County, but it, I mean, the council could have passed a redistricting act that included language that said, and if a person re person's residence is half inside, half outside, the tie goes to the district, not the at large. I mean, we could have done that. And if we would have done that, it doesn't seem to me we would have been violating the Constitution. Now we're doing it after the fact. And that's not the way, the best way to do it. But so I, I, I just, I, I respect your position. I just think we, we can do this. But I do understand where you're coming from. But I do think we, for the same reason we could have done it in the first instance, we could have passed a law that said, here's the district line, and if you, and if you write on it, you're inside. We could have done it. We didn't do it. Now we're doing it after the fact. I'm not coming that there's a, there's another little issue. The Constitution says you must live within the district to vote in the district. Well, then, Mr. Chairman, what does live within that, the district mean? If you have a house that part in the district and part out of the district, then the issue becomes does that house have to be all the way in the district before you can? That's not a question, a legal question I could answer, but that's an ambiguity that the court would have to interpret. I think. But it, invi it invites either regulation by the commission or it invites legislation by the council. That, that ambiguity could be resolved in one of those two manners, I think. I mean, we could say, we're, I mean, we do it all the time. We pass a statute that says, pursuant to this constitutional provision, here's what we're doing. That's our authority to do it. I, just, I, just, I think the best course of action would be a statute that says what it is. A regulation from you all would do it, too. But, uh, but I guess we'll we'll have here before you now is a resolution, which is a, a different animal too. It's true. I would prefer a statute. Uh, the resolution looks more like you're trying to tell the commission what to do. Well, if we passed a statute, we'd be telling you what to do too. Uh, but, but anyway, I, I understand it. You know, I understand your position. Uh, well, it, it appears here. Here's my problem. We're, we've got an individual that we're making the change for. When we just a little tweaking of this, we could say, if the house, based on Cherokee Nation Geodata Department, is 50% or more within our jurisdiction, then that person in that house, occupying that house, votes as in that district. Let, instead of having names, let's pass a rule Let's pass. Let's make a let's make a requirement, and let's don't have an individual's name in here. We're well within our realm of passing legislation that says this is how we want you to interpret this situation. What I guess I don't like is it appears that we're passing a resolution for one parcel juice. I would rather, and I would ask um, Councillor Garvin if he would consider this that we remove the individual and we utilize the 50% rule, maybe we'll let's say, you got to, if it's 50-50, that's probably not good that's either. Maybe, okay, let's say if the house is 75%, the <coughs> residence is 75% within the district, then that's the district that he's allowed to vote in. He or she, whoever occupies that house. Now, I think we can pass such a rule or such a requirement. What I don't like about this and what concerns me is it's got an individual's name in it. And I know we have to have this problem along those boundary lines at other places. And our job is to look at the bigger picture, I guess, and say, where we have this problem, here's the rule that takes care of it. 
Here's the law that takes care of it. Now, that's just giving them direction. And then they take that law and they make the determination if that 75% rule is met. And I would offer that to Mr. Barkin as a friendly amendment. What I'm seeing on this map is that house is probably 90% within a district. And I'm suggesting a 75% rule, get away from the 50%. I'd be open to 65, Mr. Garvin, or 60, but let's get away from 50-50, and let's make it a rule that they can then interpret instead of ordering them to put an individual at a certain place. Mr. Speaker, are you offering that, a friendly amendment to the council? Yes, I am. Councilman Garvin? I think I understand that uh, I know I've talked to Todd Embry, I've talked to Diana, Talk to our speaker, and all these attorneys have been advising me. And I didn't talk, talk to Chuck, but uh, he supported me, so I didn't think I needed to. But we're getting all these different opinions, and uh, this one person just wants to vote inside the district. It's no big deal to me, or I guess to him, but it needs to be settled. And, uh, I thought Todd was telling me right, and I thought Diane was telling me right. And I'm going to accept your friendly amendment to get this out of the way. And I really it think it, it works, and it will work now for everything that comes up along this line. I accept your amendment. Yeah. Okay, I get it from you. What percentage? Uh, do you want to accept 60% or 75%? Well, I'm going to accept 60%. Okay. We've got, uh, we've got a friendly uh, accepted by the move. Who's seconding the Councilman Thornton? Councilman Thornton, do you accept this, the friendly amendment to 60% a standard across the board as opposed to the specific citizen? That friendly has been accepted by Mr. Garber. Reluctantly. Who urges you to accept? Reluctantly. He reluctantly accepts. Uh, all right, we'll move on with discussion. Um, I, I still have something to say here about this. Uh, and my thought is, <laughs> and my thought is, can you hold that? I, had, I, I said reluctantly, but I had to really say yes. Oh, you have to say yes. yes uh -huh. I misinterpreted. <laughs> I think it's a yes, no question, Councilman. But uh, my thought is, if a person has a house right on the line, and we're deciding where they are and where they're not. And if, and this line touches their home, why not let that person decide? If he wants to vote at large or if he wants to vote in the district. I don't see that much in that many houses sitting on that line. I, I just can't do it because a lot, most of your boundary lines are, are set by a river or a stream or a, a road or something of that nature. I think that's probably the only boundary line. Well, Councilman, in view, that, in view of your observation, do you accept his friend? The, yeah, I'll give him a shut up. That's what you want. Well, I just want to know where we stand on the debate here. Uh, Councilman Fraley, I've got you next. Uh, I agree with uh, Ms. Corey Jordan to a certain extent. I think something needs to be in writing. Uh, but I think we're overstepping again, overreaching. And I think it should be a policy decision rather than a, a law, um, a policy based on the election law rather than an amendment or a law. But let them come up with a policy. That way, I don't think we're overreaching. So I'll be voting now on the amendment. Uh, Councilman Keener, I have you next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Justice on this one particular address with the names mentioned. Is that the only one in the? Jurisdiction. Okay. Situation. okay, with the with the new district boundaries, I, I can't say for sure because we haven't looked at those real close. But in ten years of doing this, close to ten years of doing this, this is the only address we've ever come across where a Cherokee citizen lives there, and it's right on the line. There may be other houses, especially in the Tulsa area, where our jurisdictional boundary line is cutting the house. But we've never had a request to check any of those. This is the only one we've ever had a request to check. Okay, and, and when you look at this, the map you provided us in our book is roughly 89% of the house. Yeah. And then if we went to another percentage, would 
because we're already seeing seeing those. I couldn't notice. I couldn't haven't noticed any. This is the only residential address that has come into this uh, unique category like this, where where a Cher Cherokee citizen lives. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, I agree with something that Councillor Thornton said. I think that if any part of the residence is in one district or another, whether it be at large or between two districts within the nation, that if any part of the house is in there, that that individual could then decide a one-time decision as to which a district you, they want to vote in. Are you, uh, are you making a, an amendment, a uh, motion, or are you asking for a friendly amendment? Actually, I'll ask for a friendly amendment. Council Garvin, what say you? I've got a complex of my own, right? <laughs> 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 I thought we had something. If he accepted, this would override the other one. Oh, my. Where did you have us, Okay. Is that if any part of a house, or the house is divided into two different districts, whether it's districts within the nation or between a district within the nation and then at large, then that person has the choice of deciding which district he could vote in. A one-time choice. And it remains that. You can't switch back and forth between elections. I'll accept that. It's been accepted by Councilman Thornton, so, and we'll need some wording on this resolution, but the effect of it is that if any house, make sure I understand this, Councilors, if any house, if any portion of a house, the residence resides inside the Cherokee Nation, the, the resident voter has the option whether to be, which side of the line, then he or she wants right. to be on. If it's it could be even within the nation, between two districts within the nation. And I suppose, Counselor, a husband and wife might choose different. Yes, they could. A son and father, etc. Very good. That's raised additional questions. Uh, but I had Counselor Count Watts next. So I think that his amendment, friendly amendment if accepted, would address my concerns, and it would remove the name of the individual and then allow all this to occur and fix what we believe is probably potential more homes in this situation, I guess, uh, going forward, if it addressed the internal districts as well. Anything else, Councilor? No, thanks. Councilor Walker, I'm in favor with uh, Councilman Fred. I think we're overstepping the uh, boundaries of the commission. I think that we need to respect their duties and uh, uh, these are good recommendations to take back to your commission for ideas, but I'll, I'll be voting on this as well. Councilman Walksick, would you yield to the chairman of the commission? I know he would, rises yeah. and yes, would like to say something. The thing I'd like to say is when we made our decision, we had the first mail that came out. And, and I told the uh, rest of the members of the commission, I said, you know, I don't want to see anybody left out. But if this house is not in the district and that person files a run against a council member and they win, then the council member is going to come back on the commission and say, hey, his house wasn't all in the district. So we kind of, we, we decided, you know, we're, we're not going to make an exception. If they're in, they're in. If they're out, they're out. The address showed that it was out of the Cherokee Nation. That's all we had to first serve. Our opinion on was the first map that came out. And since then, there's been about two or three maps coming. So if we're going to make a 60%, a 70%, or an 80%, then who's going to make the determination who has got the 60, 70, or 80? Is it going to be the election commission? Or are we going to have to come before the council and say, okay, y'all vote and see if this is 60%? Because the line may just vary a little bit on another map. So, I mean, and, and the, I kind of like... Uh, the councilman stated, you know, if their house is split, then they can either choose to be at large or in the nation. But, just like I say, if that house not, and it's in, in Mr. Garvin's district, 
And we'd have put it in. And he run against Mr. Garvin. He got beat. Mr. Garvin would be on us saying, hey, his house wasn't all in the nation. So we'd be in trouble, you know. I mean, how did you put him in the nation? Because his house isn't all in the nation. So, I mean, we're betwixt and between. I mean, we're supposed to be sovereign. We're supposed to make our decisions. We're supposed to do our things that we're supposed to do without being influenced by anybody. And we can't campaign. We can't put a sticker on our car. We can't do anything, you know. But then we make a decision and then this man has never filed an appeal or come to the commission and asked why did we not put him in the Cherokee Nation? It's all been brought up by Mr. Garvin. Mr. Horton, uh, and first off, Mr. Garvin, you're you're this gentleman's representative. I always assume that you were acting on his behalf. He's a constituent, so I assume that's why you've raised this issue. Mr. Horton, do you want to have an election commission meeting before our next full council meeting? We'll have one a week from this coming Tuesday. I wonder if in view of the fact that you now have another map for Mr. Justice, which he says, I think, I don't want to put words in the mouth of Mr. Justice, is a more accurate depiction of this area. If you wouldn't have occasion at your next meeting to look at this again, and that's that's what you could do. I can bring it up before my council members, and if they vote it down, they'll vote it down. Okay. I mean, that's, uh, I don't know if that's going to change what we're going to do. Here, I don't know whether that's changed anything or not, because I don't know how they're going to vote. I mean, it's their it's their opinion. We, we, are the, we were the ones that made the... Uh, Decision. The only way I can vote is on a tie, anyway. You know. Okay. Uh, well, I, we appreciate your comments, Mr. Warden. Any further discussion of the Thank you. resolution? I'm dirty. I've been picking up rock questions. The question's been called. All those in favor of the resolution as well, it's amended. Uh, How did it finally come out amended? Uh, Mr. Garvin accepted. Mr. Thornton accepted. Mr. Baker's suggestion. His friendly amendment. Okay. That's okay. I just want to make sure. Thank you. Thank you. And the friendly amendment is that if uh, if if a resident, we're not talking about a, a specific individual. If any portion of a residence relies uh, lies rather inside a district, that person gets to decide whether he's in or out. Option to the option to the voters is, is the essence of this. The one time only. One time only. If any portion. If any portion. If any portion. And you could have four people living in that house, and you could have. Multiple opinions about where that house lies. <coughs> the voter herself wants to decide. The voter decides. So two of them can say we're in, and two of them can say we're out. That's that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. One that can run at large, other one can run in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, and our all lines clear on the resolution. Is this 60 40 or 75? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a okay. uh, speck of dirt. That's why I have that. Point of, point of information, point of order. Any portion of the physical home residence. Any portion of the physical home. Is that your understanding, Mr. Garvin? Is that your understanding, Mr. Gordon? Yes. What's the definition of physical? <laughs> I mean, are we talking we should already the bricks and mortar, or are we talking the patio, or uh, what? Council Council Washington yields for response to this. Yeah. The uh, speaker brings up an excellent point because our Supreme Court has determined that an RV is where your home is where your heart is. So <laughs> we better back up. Okay. And you, you, you may, this is a very real and serious issue that was just brought up, and I, we probably need to table it for another month, and I hate to do that, Mr. Garvin, but we are opening up a very big can of worms right there. Is that a motion to table, Counselor? Yes, it is. We have a second? Second. Motion is made and second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those same sign. Aye. That's tabled for a month. <coughs> Abstain. abstain. I'm going to stay on the way to do it. Sorry about that. All right. All right. Moving on to home business item number five. Uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, yes, this has uh, been carried over for a couple of months now. And what we were doing was um, canvassing other tribes in the state of Oklahoma, the larger tribes in the country, to see what their requirement, requirements were pertaining to family, uh, public 
or elected or uh, appointed officials. We've got our canvassing completed. We have rewritten the act with the most important portion being 2819 section A. And I believe that this is consistent with the Constitution. We were very careful to even take language from the Constitution so that we would be in compliance with our own Constitution, consistent with what we've seen across Indian Country. And I'm asking this for your consideration today. I would put it in the form of a motion. Second, second, <coughs> second by Councilwoman Fishing Hawk. Any further discussion on your part, Madam Speaker? I believe we've done the best work we can on this particular issue. All right. Thank Council, you. Councilwoman Scott Thank you. And, and I appreciate all the work that's been gone into it, but this is the first that we've seen it is here on our desk today at these meetings. Um, and I have a number of issues that I thought were really important in the earlier Sunshine Act. And when I tried to read through it really quickly, they're not covered about how we're going to disclose things. Or at least in the two seconds I have to read it, I'm not going to be able to make an important decision. I'd like another month. And then some of the issues, I'd like your understanding of how this is different than the one we're repealing. <coughs> I would like to understand why it doesn't include also uh, some of our constitutional obligations about working for other tribes, because I think we have questions about two council members working for other tribes that, that hasn't been disclosed. Um, we've got all this other stuff that probably needs to go into it, so I would like a month to look at it so that we know, and then how, what's the process we're disclosing. You know, and it also affects some commission members. Will this affect the commission, the election commissioner that's working for Kalen Free in the chief's office? Does that also affect them? And do we need to consider that? Because the way I read it, that would also affect them. Are you making a motion, Council? I'll make a motion to table for one month so that we can read it. Motion second. All right, we have a motion to table. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, same side. Aye. Let's have a roll call. Motion to table. <coughs> Jack Baker? Yes. Joe Bird? No. Julia Coates? Yes. Jody Fishinghoff? No. Meredith Fraley? Yes. Janelle Fulbright? No. Bob Barbin? Frankie Hargis? No. Chuck Hoskin Jr.? No. Hannah Gloria Jordan? No. Lee Keener? Yes. Dick Lay? No. Curtis Snell? No. David Thorpe? No. David no. Wallenstick? Kara Callen Watts? Yes. Bill Anglin? Yes. Six yes and ten no. Motion table fails. Any further discussion on the motion to approve? No discussion. We'll proceed. This is an act. Mr. Chairman, I had questions. So how is this different, and what about all these other disclosures, and what's the disclosure process now? Let's, let's take your questions. What, what was your, can you answer that, ma'am? Yeah. There is no disclosure. <coughs> there, is, there is no disclosure. Other tribes don't require it. If your people want to make application. They go through human resource. If they are selected for a panel, they're like any other person that makes application for a job. They uh, go in for an interview. If they are the selected person, as long as they do not work for this branch of government, if they're within, I believe it's the first degree, they can't work for the branch of government that the public official or appointed official is in within the first degree, but they're, they're free to apply for jobs. Uh, you can go to the creeks right now. Uh, they have a similar law. It's working. You can go to the Chalks. You can go to the Chickasaws. You can go to the Osages. We have the most restrictive law apparently in the country, even with the Navajos. Um, and we're just not seeing it across Indian country. We are a tribe of 
300,000 people, we all though come from a very small pool of people. Originally, uh, what crossed the Trail of Tears and what got on the Dolls Rose was a very small group of people. So we all come from a very small pot of people, and this thing has been going on for years and years and years, and this council needs to settle. Uh, we're no different than other tribes across Indian Country. If it works for them, I believe it will work for us. We just need to settle it and be done with it. I encourage you to vote this and move it forward to full council. These other items that are being brought up, you can always bring these up and amend if you want to later. This is just a very good basic law to start with. We made it very simple, very straightforward. <coughs> Still have the floor, Council of Candlewoods. Thank you. So just to just to make sure my mind's clear because we're about I mean I know we're inevitably it seems like I'm gonna take a vote. So there, even so, the disclosures that we've had in place, those all go away, and then even the housing HUD disclosures, those would go away as well. Those are required by federal law. Okay. We don't. A housing is a state agency. As of October one, housing receives federal funds. HUD has requirements on those disclosures. Uh, he, he would need, uh, or housing would need to continue to make disclosures on. Anybody that's getting, getting help from housing, that's what those those disclosures have always been in place and had nothing to do with anything that we required. Mr. Chairman, may I continue? And, and I appreciate the ability to, to get questions answered. So, and, and to make sure I heard you correctly earlier, so any um, employment and contracting and all that, that's just going to go through the normal processes now, as long work, as there's I no didn't creating. Change. There's nothing changed from a couple of months ago on contracting when we voted. We did find that was consistent across Indian Country too. Where where is the contracting? Um, it would be page four twenty eight, section twenty. No, that that there wasn't a word in that that changed from the old law. And we did make inquiries about that also. This is the only it, how is that not um, contradicting itself within page 3A? So it looks like if people are allowed to do things, because this affects employees, because I know there's lots of employees that own businesses, their spouse owns businesses, or their children. Um, and they've asked a lot of questions. So it appears in three, section 528A at the top that you're allowed as long as it's not improperly soliciting or those kind of things that create an actual conflict. That part, uh, Kara, was not changed from the old law either. Uh, yeah, 28 section 11A, 28 section 13A, uh, 28 section 20 a was not changed from the old law that was already in force I guess I appreciate that other tribes uh, may not require disclosure the transparency part but I thought that was one of the brilliance mm -hmm. of, of doing the earlier act was that we put everything on the table so I'm concerned, why would we pull back other than other tribes don't disclose? This is not part of the act that I wrote. Uh, if this is something that you want to do, then if this act is passed, then you write what you want to write and, and go for an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I had Councilor <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On page five, item C, the first item there is not a complete sentence. It doesn't say anything. And I don't know what it is meant to say. Since we're a relative of any elected official in any district court judge or any Supreme Court justice is employed or appointed to any position within the nation's court system instrumentalities. Period. Um, I think there, 
I think we left off just a little bit when we retyped it because it was not changed either from the old law. But it, but it still is incomplete. It's not clear. Say what it means. It's not. I mean, it's not clear. Uh, Ms. Barker. One thing I've discovered is when I undo the PDF and put it in a Word document, sometimes, and I think Shelly would probably say the same thing, you'll have periods in a place where it shouldn't be. Was that a and that was just that was just the cut and paste and just we can we can fix that, Shelly and I can fix that. Can you look at the O one? I think it was a comma, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it was a, yeah, it I, I believe a it was a comma. But that was cut and paste. But it, Mr. Baker, it had not been changed from the other. Well, no, I'm just concerned that it yeah. doesn't make sense the way it is. And I, I, I would propose, and a comma probably would. I, would, I believe it was a comma there, and I would uh, uh, amend my motion to include that on 28-7-21-C, <coughs> after instrumentalities, that instead of a period, that become a comma. Anything further, Mr. Baker? No, thank you. Councilor Coates? I, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to clarify uh, on page 4, 28, section 20, at the bottom, contracting with relatives of elected officials. This is the amendment that we made a few months ago. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Same wording. Same wording. I, I did not. Uh, okay. I wasn't. Other than us canvassing to make sure that we were online with what was being done across Indian country on contracting, okay. we did not change a word in that paragraph. The, the, I, I, I want to ask the Attorney General to, to come up if you would, because uh, uh, you knew that I would <laughs> uh, bring forth my question that I hadn't received a response to. I, but as I recall, that was um, that was an eight to eight vote, I believe, or no? There were it was there were it, there were people who had abstained from it. Mm -hmm. Right, and that uh, there was a question as to whether it had actually yes. passed because the vote was a tie, I believe. To and I have assigned that to one of our attorneys who are, who are researching that. And mm -hmm. let me tell you, that's come about more than what I thought it had come about. Mm -hmm. We are, we I will get you an opinion, um, but um, um, so uh, if, if if this were to pass full council. It wouldn't render your opinion moot, but because we still need to answer that question. But it would cure the defect in the act if you pass an act that totally uh, repeals one and replaces it with another. Okay, thank you. Well, what I'm, what I guess I'm getting to is that in fact this is not clearly something that is already in the law. It is something that has been added in recent months and under conditions where several people on this body felt that they needed to abstain from it. And so I would presume the same thing, that with the inclusion of this now into this, we would have the same situation where uh, several people on this body might feel the need to abstain from it again, from, from voting on this. I don't know, but that would, that would be speculation at least. So I did want to bring that forth, that this, this is something that we still have some, some lack of clarity about whether, in fact, this was actually passed uh, several months ago, this one amendment. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, and I think to that point, so uh, my husband owns a company which would, as at times, has been a subcontractor because they're the only Indian owned entity that does what they do in the specialty work of peer drilling. So, we're um, excluding one group of employment to include a number of relatives for other council members um, that are close relatives. So I have to abstain today because it affects potentially my husband's business and I would assume that those individuals would also abstain today. And under our constitution it requires a majority of those people actually present in order to pass. Which an abstention is effectively a no vote in reality in that context. And so I think that's part of what that question is around um, the questions posed to the Attorney General and should be considered by each council member. Thank you. I kind of disagree with this abstention process. If someone believes someone on this council has a conflict in voting on anything, 
they are welcome to bring it to this council where the current rule says that this council can vote whether that person can continue to vote on that issue or not. A majority vote, they cannot vote. A majority vote the other way, they can vote. I hear threats that people should abstain from voting on certain laws, and that is simply not true. If you think someone has a conflict, you bring it before this body, we'll vote whether they can vote on that issue or not. But the use of abstention, the way some people are trying to use it, is more a threat than anything else. This could conceivably either have affected people in the past, affect them in the present, affect them in the future. So logically, none of the 17 of us could vote on this particular law. But all 17 of us should vote on it because it sets the tone for are we going to include everyone in the ability to apply for a job? Are we going to exclude a number of people that might be decent employees for this organization and other organizations that are associated with us? We are one of the largest tribes in the country, and tribes similar in size to us, the Navajos in particular, other tribes that are surrounding us have all took the high road and said, look, let's just let everyone apply. If they are successful, good for them. We'll just make sure that whoever uh, might be somewhat kin to them cannot be the person that gives them direction. But I take offense at suggesting that people on this body should abstain from voting for lack of a better, I mean basically it's just a, it's just a threat. I will be voting on this and I encourage each and every one of you all to cast your vote on this. This sets the tone for this tribe for the future. This is an important subject. Your constituents are interested in this. We need to get this done. It, it has become a big problem with this body. And it, and it needs to be decided by everyone in this room. And with that, I would call for the question. Let's move forward. The council of Coates, next. Well, I'm, I'm sorry if I miss you know, came across that I, as a threat, I mean, I, I presume that the reason that people abstain is because they want to uh, preserve a sense of integrity. And since, um, since this was being presented as this is language that is in the old act, this is language in the old act, we looked at several sections and it had said it was language in the old act. Uh, in fact, 2820 is, is relatively new language. Uh, that we've just added in the past few months and I was just concerned that people were going to not be aware of that um, but in fact it's not that old and uh, just call it to people's attention that that it was there and that people had abstained on it um, not to tell anybody what to do that's I, I said you know that would be speculation on my part but I know that I am someone who uh, would want to act with integrity and if I had cast a vote from a position of integrity a few months ago on something and then I wasn't aware that that was included in this because it was being couched as something in the old act, uh, I personally would have appreciated it being brought to my attention. So that's, that's all I was intending to do uh, by this so that, so that people can act with the, with the greatest degree of integrity that I require that I think is required of this body and I think that I'm sure all of us want to want to meet. So that was my only intention, not not to threaten. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, we'll move to a vote. This is an uh, Councillor Thornton. Okay. Before we vote, I just want to make an announcement. I don't have anyone within the first degree that's working for a contractor or working for the nation. All right, we'll move now to a uh, roll call vote. Uh, yes to approve the legislation. No to oppose it. Chanel Fulbright? Yes. Don Garvin? No. Frankie Hargis? Yes. Chuck Huskin Jr.? Yes. Tana Glory Jordan? Yes. Lee Keener? No. Dick Lay? 
Yes. Curtis Snell? Yes. David Thornton? Yes. David Waterstick? Yes. Karen Tom Watts? Abstain. Bill Anklin? Abstain. Jack Baker? No. Joe Bird? Yes. Julia Coates? No. Jody Fishenkopf? Yes. Meredith Fraley? Yes. Business is item one under new business and act relating to the chair nation guardianship and conservatorship code. Uh, Council Friday, you want to take it? Garcia here is the author of this, <clears throat> and I would move for its approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion for approval, second by Councilman Bird. Uh, any further discussion? Any, any questions from Mr. Garcia? Can I, I speak? I did have one question, Bob. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Um, and I am the sponsor of it, uh, along with Ms. Ms. Riley. But my question, uh, on order of preference in section 18 on page 10, Yes, ma'am. If this was a circumstance in which the parents had passed away, leaving a will, um, and in that will they identified the person that they wanted to have their children, did I miss where we were going to acknowledge the will was superior to everything. I no. thought maybe it was in another section. I read it really careful, but I didn't see it. And I think under 18A3, uh, that's a person who is indicated by the wishes of a deceased parent. Uh, but, but I guess my question is this, Bobby. You've given it a third preference. And again, uh, operation of law, uh, by operation of law, that really would take uh, precedence of uh, you know, just somebody coming in petitioning. Well, I've been in those cases, though, where the will says child will go to A who's not the grandparent. Maybe it's a sister or a brother of the deceased parents. Um, of course, first, if only one parent dies, the other parent would would be superior unless proven unfit. Right. Uh, if both parents were dead and the last parent that died had a will uh, and, and provided for that person, uh, and maybe that person's not the grandparent. And I'm a grandparent, so I mean, this is a real question for me. It's, been, it, it's a real struggle for me. But for example, let's say, uh, <coughs> and I hope this never happens, but something happened to my son, and a child was at play, and maybe because of my age, my son will decided that he decided it would be best for the child to go stay with the younger set of of, of people. I mean, I can see that happening because I've I've been in those cases where it has happened. And I, as a grandparent, it would be very hard for me if I thought I could be a better parent. I might run to the tribal court because that child would be Indian and say, well, hey, I'm the grandparent and I get the second preference here. And I, understand, I think I understand where you're coming from that. Um, that would go into consideration in the best interest of termination. Um, you know, obviously, we're not going to be placing children uh, in, you know, 
I, I don't think you get my point here. If it's in the will in the state of Oklahoma, if it's in that will, then unless that person is unfit, that person gets a job. I mean, there's no, there's no determining best interest here. That person gets the child because that was the desire of the the parent that wrote the wheel. I can say that we've had that in our travel court. Um, we, not recently, but it's been a while. What we did is as we went in and made sure that that person in that wheel wasn't unfit, make sure that they could uh, meet the child's needs, that there wasn't any issue or problem, that it, was, it also met our placement preferences. Um, if it's a non-Indian, if it's a non-relative, then we're, we're going to present that to the court. You know, this is a non, non-Indian, non-Cherokee, non-Native, as to the placement preferences, and it can just explain to the court as to if they're not unfit, but they don't meet those placement preferences that the Act sets out and that our, our, our code sets out. Um, if, if they met that placement preference as far as being Native and okay. being a family, that will of that parent would supersede. But where does it say that? What does where it does it say that will supersedes? The, to me, in order of preference, the will, if admitted and upheld by a valid court, supersedes this preference. Because this is basically without a will. The way you've written it, you did not take into consideration someone has a valid will that determines that this child is to be placed with certain individuals. Now, I, I know what you're saying. A person who is indicated by the wishes of a deceased parent, well, you'll hear people go to the courthouse and say, hey, my brother said he wanted me to take that child if something happened to him. Well, that's indicated by the wish, you know, that's someone verbally indicating the wishes of a deceased parent. I'm talking about a legal document that the parent has had prepared that says this is where my children should go in the event of my death. Always in my mind, every law and, and every state that I've ever uh, looked at this, the will was superior to anything. My question is, did we provide for that in our tribal laws? Um, and, well, and I don't really want a table, but I, I think what I wanted to hear, I guess I'm kind of like y'all over here, what you wanted to hear. Uh, what from a previous speaker? What I want to hear is that we follow what the law is, which is if it's a valid will and that person is not a fallen down total drunk or a drug user or totally unfit, that's where that child goes. That was that parent's. Yeah. That that was that parent's privilege and right to seek out during his mm -hmm. lifetime what. Uh, uh, where, the, where his child should go. It might not be with grandma. I would hope that they like me enough that they would let me do that, but they may decide. And I I, I kind of, during the time I was raising my children, I had this same problem. I thought, well, would my mom and dad really want to take my rambunctious kids? Would they be better suited if something happened to me in my travels that they go to a younger set of parents? I mean, this is this is the age-old question that you have when you're preparing a wheel. And I see Todd's uh, up. I, I, I know he has to say something, so I'm going to throw the ball back to him. <laughs> I would agree with you. Will supersede any general statute. And, and, and that's, you know, the, the one part about, uh, you know, the, the, in the case of a guardianship, you're dealing with, you know, a, a non-testate situation, in my opinion. And I don't, you know, I think, uh, and it is my opinion that you know we're a court that follows common law that we that, that will do supersede a, a guardianship statute. So I, I I don't think it is necessary to spell that out directly because I mean it's it's almost an apples and oranges type deal. You know, not we don't put adoption law. You know that you know that, that adoption law adoption supersede you know guardianships either. I mean it, it is a it's a different breed of animal. Uh, so I believe that we're we're safe in the passage of this act that we're not going to have someone come in and say this guardianship act is going to supersede that person's, you know, uh, uh, test state message. Okay, now, as I've always said, I've always followed Todd's recommendations, and I'm going to follow them this time. 
I just don't want to get somebody in my office saying, yeah, I have a will, my brother had a will, and these kids are going somewhere else, and why is my brother or sister's will not being on? They, uh, I, and I, I would be shocked if a court at all. Uh, Other than that, I thought this was a great piece but of legislation. I, I, I think it's a great piece of legislation. <laughs> and I will be voting for it, relying on you all to do the right thing, because we'll sure hear about it if it doesn't work quite right that way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Speaker. Any further questions? Discussion? Right. This is an act. We'll move to a roll call vote. Shall we? Yeah. Big light? Yes. Curtis now? Yes. David Thornton? Yes. David Walkenstein? Yes. Kara Callan Watts? Bill Anglin? Jack Baker? Yes. Joe Bird? Yes. Julia Coates? Yes. Joe Dishenkopf? Yes. Meredith Braylor? Yes. Janelle Fulbright? Yes. Don Garvin? Yes. Gregory Hargis? Yes. Chuck Costin Jr.? Yes. Anna Gloria Jordan? Yes. Lee Keener? Yes. We have 15 yes. 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 Another business, last item of business, item number two, a new business, uh, Madam Speaker. I'm actually uh, pulling that. And, well, I guess the uh, type uh, uh, Yeah, I'll just pull it. All right, cool. All right, next announcements. Uh, full appreciation is already going on out of the gym, I guess. Um, all right, entertain a motion to adjourn. Yes. Hardness, second. second by Council Bird, all those favor say aye. Aye. Uh, the same sign, we're adjourned. <laughs> well, too much time to do what he needs.